Hey, welcome to the 334th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Luke Cheney. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan. And today we have a director named Laura Everly on the podcast. She is also a great actor and she's a friend of ours. And she has directed a ton of commercials. She just did a pilot with Gina Davis. She has been directing and acting forever. And you've probably even seen her on a billboard or two because... She also models and her kids model and she is a photographer and she's just like does everything. But what I find most interesting about her is as long as her resume is and as long as her reel is and all the wonderful things she's done. We talk a lot about the struggles of like just identifying yourself as a director and kind of the imposter syndrome of it all. That stuff that we all go through because she just had an interview where she talks about comparing herself to other people and it's just... It's a pitfall that all of us as directors have. And I think the sign of like a director that's been doing it for a while is someone that can somehow trick themselves into not worrying about other people as much. But it's really fun talking to her. We talk about comedy, about cameras, what it means to be a director nowadays. I think it's a really fun conversation. We go in deep. I think it's really fun. And this is one of those conversations where I feel like, you know, I'm going to think about it for a long time. So much of it resonated with me. It really was absorbing things. But I think that the themes and ideas, I think, resonate with all filmmakers and certainly are recurrent in many of the conversations that we've had over the years with people, both on and off the mic. This one is fun because I think that a lot of the conversation we used to have this conversation over beers after we were done with the show, you know, and like this time we're kind of like, it feels a little bit more backstage in a way that's really fun and cool. Before we talk to Laura, we want to tell you about a couple things. Number one is our amazing editor, Noah Bayshore has a seed and spark campaign. He's working on a new movie called Walter Grace and the Submarine. And you guys should check it out. It's a Midwestern rom-com. If you go to seed and spark.com slash fund slash Walter Grace and the Submarine, you can learn all about it. Yeah, we love supporting filmmakers and we love our editors. So you should check it out. He has all sorts of really interesting information about the project and the plan. As a person who is interested in crowdfunding in a general sense, Noah's video is really great. And I think it does a really good job of A, most importantly, explaining the story. But B, it sets the tone for what I imagine the film will feel like in a certain sense. Not literally. It's not like Noah's doing scene work, but he's like presenting a point of view and a sense of humor and a visual style that perhaps will be echoed within the film. So I would recommend if you are curious about what a good seed and spark or just general crowdfunding video looks like and feels like that's not quippy in the way I think sometimes that yeah Kickstarter video will be like, and that's where you come in, (laughs) right? You know, and look, that's okay. There are lots of successful campaigns and great films that have had that tone, but it's become a little tropey now. And this, I think, maybe breaks that a little bit. So if you're curious about that, go check it out. And then give our boy some money or just a, a like or a share or something like that is good, too. But one more time, it's seedandspark.com slash fund slash Walter Grace and the submarine all spelled out. And if you have more money left over after you visited that page, you should check out patreon.com slash just shoot pod. It's where you can support us and even give us a few dollars so we can pay Noah to edit the podcast. And then maybe when he has some free time to, you know, to work on his feature. If you give to us at the $15 level, I will personally mail you a just shoot it podcast hat it's an amazing hat in the summer it's more important than ever to wear hats i don't know about you matt but i don't like to wear sunscreen on my face my wife kara is constantly yelling at me about it and saying it's, mm, it's she's the right. worst thing i can do she's right but yeah. i explained to her that i have a just shoot it hat that is protecting my face from the sun so mm-hmm. leave me alone mm. i don't need sunscreen if i have a hat on and you can say that too to people like dermatologists, grandmas, et cetera, mm-hmm. that are pressuring you to put sunscreen on. Uh, if you get our hat, $15, one month, I'll mail it to you. You're going to love it. Or you know what? Just give us $4. It's been a really popular tier recently. Well, without further ado, <laughs> patreon.com slash just shoot a pod is a place where you can help us out. Let's hop into our conversation with Laura. Hey, Laura Everly. Thank you for joining us. Finally. After 12 years of doing this podcast. Woo woo! I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome. I've known Laura for many years. I've met you as an actor. I believe I cast yeah. you in a show called I Hate My Roommates. 
Yeah, I was going to say it goes back to I hate my roommates. That was a really fun shoot, I have to say. Matt, you you guys have met each other before, right? Yeah, we've known each other for a long time. Were you in an improv class or a troupe or improv, basically, is how I know you? Chrissy and I were in Upright Citizens Brigade together, taking classes. We were in like those early classes together. But so back then, obviously, I met you as an actor and you met Matt as an actor, but you were already back then, I think you had already been directing some shorts. This is like 15 years ago or something, right? Were you always, you always wanted to be a director and an actor? Looking back on it, it seems so obvious now that directing was the path. And I had been directing theater even back in like high school, but you know, like my big thesis in college was directing this play, but I wasn't a film major. I think I was just very intimidated by gear and I just thought it was easier to, sorry. Yeah. Some gear fell over. <laughs> it's like gear a gods. Like, yeah, you had a C stand in your closet, and it was like, "We hear you." I read you had this awesome article interview in Medium. The pull quote is, "Don't be intimidated by gear. Like, don't worry about that. Like, you can be a filmmaker." But your dad's a freaking DP for like <laughs> Disney movies. Like, how do you? Why are you intimidated by gear? Like, you grew up with cameras and stuff. I don't know. I honestly, I'm, I'm like, maybe there's a lot to unpack here. Like, I didn't want to be too much like my dad. So I never learned the gear mm-hmm. side too much or something. Like, maybe this is like straight up like psychotherapy, some kind of like paternal aversion. But I don't know. My dad is a documentarian filmmaker. My parents um, had a stock footage library going up. But this was, you know, primarily in the era of film. And there was so much stuff. And it was actually so burdensome. Like we would travel to Asia or Africa with 12 heavy film cases and get stuck in immigration Mm -hmm. for like three hours trying to speak a language that we didn't speak. Just to clarify. So you're like, oh, I'm a kid. My parents are going to like take me on this trip. There's maybe a few days of vacation, but it's mostly a work trip. And they're going to be shooting stock footage, essentially, and maybe also a movie all at the same time. Yes. And I'm very, very grateful for the experience, but it was a bizarre upbringing. And it wasn't exactly like what you picture. It was I remember getting into a fight with my dad once because I wanted to go to the Louvre. Mm -hmm. in Paris when I was 11. Just the most famous museum. And he was like, like, it's a waste of a day. Mona (laughs) Schmisa. Yeah, he was like that. I can't. That's just like a lost day. Like it's a day that I can't film. It's a day. Whatever, dad, you're writing this off on your taxes either way. (laughs) Yeah, it was just like that. These were the kind of odd headbutts I would sometimes have with my parents because I'd be like, well, I want to go bungee jumping. And they're like, not a photo op or whatever it was. I mean, in the Mm -hmm. end, Mm -hmm. my parents were very gracious and generous, but it was really like the camera was another sibling. The camera was another sibling that I sometimes hated. Like that asshole older brother that took all the priorities. You know, (laughs) it was a weird relationship with the camera. But I think also as an actor, I, you know, I've always loved just the craft of it. And as an actor, sometimes it is easy, I think, to get intimidated when you show up on set and, you know, it's a 30 second spot and there's trucks lined up for, you know, a whole block and there's so much going on. And I think culturally, I was a little bit brainwashed to think like, I can't handle that or something like just Mm -hmm. as even like a woman in the industry just seemed so bra, you know, all these teamsters and all the stuff. And it just felt like a lot for a little bit. I mean, I obviously got over that. And I think that that was a falsehood and something that I had to break and had to, Mm -hmm. you know, marry my confidence with my creativity and actually just start doing stuff. But I think it can feel like a real boys club and very intimidating. I'm not afraid of the camera. I've always been into lenses and just my camera, but you know, all the things um, along. All the other stuff in the truck, basically. Yes. Yeah. I feel like there's this weird misconception in like with filmmakers that are starting out or not starting out, but that are kind of like the beginning of the (laughs) mid-level film career where there's this idea that like, oh, we just want a director that we know can handle a big crew or can handle a big big production. You know, we want to give someone $8 million to make this like small studio film. We want to know that they can handle it, that they're not going to be intimidated by condors and like 20 trucks and Mm -hmm. parking and this and that. But I think in reality, like that is not 
true. Like, I don't think anyone's ever gotten a job because like, oh, they've done an $8 million shitty ass movie, but they can handle an $8 million. Product. Like someone that made like an amazing short that won yeah. Sundance is going to have a way better chance with, with like a one man crew, the channel Black Magic Pocket Cinema or whatever, than just telling a super compelling, amazing story with great performances and great visuals will get that movie way before the person that made the like bad action movie for $8 million. Yes, I, I think that is true. I think it is important because Oren, you and I argue about this all the time. I think the thing that when people talk about quote unquote being able to handle a big crew or whatever, I think they're really talking about the politics of it all, right? Like the difference between managing a small team of people and dealing with the personalities and the studio and like, you know, the negotiations of like big name talent that have their own opinions and need to be heard. The diplomacy. Right. Or just taking notes. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Taking notes. I mean, I got my first handful of jobs and maybe even still to this day because I explained to people that I understand why people are giving notes and who is giving them and where they're coming from. And so even though I may not agree with them always, I get the corporate philosophy behind why some knob has to say, well, you can't do it this way because our lawyers have spent six months berating me about right. how last time I did it the wrong or whatever it is, you know. And I think that sometimes when you're coming up DIY and you don't have anyone else to answer to, you can be a great filmmaker and a great storyteller. But that's frankly a kind of a small part of the job, especially when it comes to commercials or studio work. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think being easy to work with is not super important. I mean, we, we disagree on this all the time, but, this but is not, that's not easy to work with. That's like running a corporation is what I'm right, talking about. You are, right, you are right. the CEO of a small company, not even a small, a mid-sized company. And that is a different job than running around with a black magic. But I guess what Lara is talking about, is like being intimidated by all the gear and all the big crew and all the teamsters and all that yes. stuff. And it's like, I think it all takes us all years to get to the confidence level where we're like, Hey, I have no idea what this thing does, but sure. I can tell you, this is what I need to happen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, also I think there was like a little bit of just like a misconception of like, it wasn't like someone was going to throw me into this thing where there was going to be like, you know, a 200 person crew sure. <laughs> right away. You got to earn that. Those are hard jobs to get as a director. I think I would just kind of treat acting as unofficial shadowing experiences and ask to stick around mm -hmm. and observe. And it felt like a lot, but it, you know, there's such a trajectory, you know, and by the time you are on those sets where there's just so many people, you do know what you're doing. And so it's like, you just have to have to start. But I mean, to, to backtrack, a little bit. It, it was the Upright Citizens Brigade and improv and sketch comedy that got me into directing because it was also the era when Funny or Die had just launched mm -hmm. and College Humor and all these things were really like, you know, the it thing. And so it was very easy to translate all these kind of goofing arounds that I was having mm -hmm. as an actor with my friends and be like, well, we should just film that. That's funny. It's, you know, and then like the next mm -hmm. weekend, oh, that idea we were talking about last week, it's still funny. Should we just do it? And so it just started very like, you know, scrappy mm -hmm. <laughs> friends, just comedian friends making stuff. Right. Like putting sketches on up online. Yeah. Filming them. And you were you had a puppeteer friend and you guys did a lot of crazy puppet mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Yep. Very rated yeah. R. Yeah, he uh, he wound up being my officiant for the wedding. He's still one of my best friends, <laughs> Jonathan. But yes, I mean, we started off uh, doing this crazy, you know, love affair music video thing called Pink Sweat on Funny or Die, where we literally built the puppets from scratch and uh, did a whole musical with puppets, very Avenue Q kind of style. Um, but from there, you know, it just kept it kept going. I worked with Awestruck, uh, you know, Awesomeness, Scary Mommy, Refinery29, all those yeah, things. Yeah, so you had done all those things, right? You didn't, you even did some work with Kara. And in the meantime, yeah. you're still acting in like TV shows and a zillion commercials. And when I met you, right when I got to LA and was just starting, like Super Deluxe was that thing we did together. It's probably like my third or fourth paid gig ever. You were, you had already been directing, but what I think is interesting just to jump ahead to now, 
not now ish, like I think three, three years ago or something pre COVID, we, you know, we had these director meetups and that's where we met Carlin, our friend and Matt and I would go and, and you went once. I went more than once. How many times? Twice did you go? <laughs> I want to say three at okay. least. <laughs> well, I was like, no matter hey, what. Yeah, yeah. Are you coming? And I remember I was like really pressuring you to come and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll come. And then at the end, you're like, N- you know what? I don't feel like going. Like, I just feel like I, I have nothing to talk about. Like everyone is like, there's like career directors. And I'm like, you know, I, I just don't feel like I'm at the same level. And in my mind, I'm like, are you insane? Like you had already done that stuff for Refinery29 and Awesomeness and Austria, like, and you'd, it funny or die and all these things. And so do you think maybe because you're acting, you're having like a pretty successful acting career, it made you feel like it took away from your identity as a director? No, because I have the same insecurities as an actor. I feel like if there was an actor's meetup, I'd be like, oh, I have nothing to contribute. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. you're like, give me a script um, and I'll contribute. Because now you're not like that, right? Like, I feel like something changed. Like, obviously, like you're repped by a production company. You're shooting a ton of commercials. You're shooting your own stuff. You have your own project. Like, like what's, what yeah. clicked that changed you from being like, eh, I don't, I don't really feel like talking as like with fellow directors to like, like your main thing is like a director. I mean, I think it's all still such a journey. And I think this is like so cheesy, but I just was like a really, really shy kid, like extremely introverted and shy. And I just lacked confidence in public spaces. And I just think this has been like my whole life trajectory. And I don't think like, you know, a switch has been flipped and I'm on the other side. I think I'm just like, further along down the path. And this is something I'm going to be like working on my entire life. And people are always like, bullshit, you are an extroverted, funny, badass. And I'm like, I I mean, you're an actor. I am. <laughs> like there is a part of me that comes off that way. But like my root, my like real self is like a total introvert and like mm-hmm. awkward, easily intimidated, you know, neurotic Jew. Like I just don't. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I think that there is a commonality of like people being confused by performers and directors in confusing us as exclusively extroverted. Like, I don't have a problem leaving a crew. I don't have a problem hosting a podcast, but like at a party, it's pretty rough. Do you know what I mean? Like, I want to be like one on one with a person or alone, frankly, you know, like or hosting the party, by the way. Matt has like, Three annual parties. That is the only way I like to do it. It's like, oh, this is I'm going to cultivate a group of people, all of whom are just one on one friends. So none of them know each other. (laughs) Right. It's also Um, you're in control of that. Like you're in control of the crowd. You know, everybody there. I know everyone. So it's, Um, it's fine. But but yeah. And I think that it is. I guess the reason I bring it up is because, you know, there are probably listeners at home who are very artistic and very introverted, you know, independent study types. And you can be a successful director or performer like that. There's a duality to that. I think, you know, you can pretend to be the director, to be the confident, you know, in charge person. And that's a role you can play, basically. Yeah. And when when you've done it enough, you can even pretend to not be confident like you know like you can just be like yeah this is just how i am i don't know what Mm -hmm. we're doing but we're gonna do it because we have to you know yeah yeah, you don't have to bullshit yeah i will say also i think this was a weird silver lining of the pandemic maybe where like like if then if there was a switch i actually think it was the shutdown because Mm. I had I had my first interview for NBC Female Forward, which for people that don't know is a program that, well, now it's been rebranded as NBC Launch. They've merged their diversity, inclusion, and equity program with their Female Forward program into one. But basically, you know, they are a program that is incredible and they support giving underrepresented people their first episode. So female directors and diverse directors, and they pair you with a show on NBC. And I had my first interview for it right during the week of the shutdown. And I, I felt like it was like so close. And then my meeting got pushed from in person to on zoom. It was my first time ever going on zoom. I wound up booking good girls. Good, good girls. Yes. We're like, we're going to wait till 2021 for your episode because of COVID and block shooting and everything's really scary and crazy. And we don't want to like throw a new director in under these conditions. And then 
to everybody's shock and sadness, the show did not get renewed. So I've interviewed for other shows. Coincidentally, I have only pivoted <laughs> from Jenna Bands, who was the showrunner of Good Girls, to her husband, who was the <laughs> showrunner of American Auto. And I'll be directing an episode of that in about two months. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, so I'm finally getting my episode. It's It's been a long COVID journey. But I could see that things were starting to percolate. And then the shutdown was happening and everything was kind of like disappearing before my eyes. I had a short film that was in consideration for Refinery 29's Shatterbox program. It was like all these things were just building. And then it was like, kapoom, like someone just put the lid on it. And my husband is a nine to five and he's in IT and like everyone needed IT in the pandemic because everything went remote. So he was like stuck on the computer. And I felt like I time traveled to like 1945 and was just like with my small children, like <laughs> doing like nothing all day with them, but like cooking and laundry and there was no school. And we were just like playing in like, you know, random dirt and creeks. And, and I just like, I had this breaking point at some point in the early pandemic where I was like, over my fucking dead body, is this my life right now? And I just started writing and like applying to more programs. And like, as soon as stuff started opening up, it was like, I was just taking no prisoners. And I was like, <laughs> coming in very strong. And I was like, I'm the, I'm the person for this. Like, I'll get COVID over it. I don't care. <laughs> I'm your director. <laughs> like, I just, I felt like I had a taste of what it felt like to uh -huh. like not have a career at all. And I got freaked out. And I was like, I just came in extra hot and I have really fascinating. And and congratulations. Like, yeah. You know. that's awesome. <laughs> I feel like the other thing you were doing again, I, you know, I follow you on social media, so I have a good idea of what's going on, at least with what you want us to think is going on. Right. I My curated like, experience. I feel like you, it's a lot of you playing, playing with the kids and dirt. <laughs> yeah. A lot of I, I, you know, kids. So one of my friends, Bill Sherman, he's an amazing musical director from Hamilton and in the Heights and all of these things. But I just ran into him at my 20 year college reunion. And he was like, oh, my God, do you do anything but have your kids run around naked? He was like, literally, he's like, every post of yours is like. I'm working. Here's my naked kids. I'm working. Here's another naked kid. But and I was there like, a lot you're, of not, you're not wrong. <laughs> But but I, I do feel like because COVID kind of was that time where everyone's like, hey, shoot your own stuff at home. And all of a sudden, everyone is just armed with a 5D or a Sony A7S or whatever. Everyone is on this. No one has the line of trucks out the window. I feel like yeah, you were really excelling then because you I mean, you're also a pretty awesome photographer um, and you were doing a lot of photography and you were doing a lot of art and, and directing kind of small things that you could do like COVID safe things. and. I feel like just hearing like what intimidated you in the beginning of your career, like yeah. all the gear and stuff and COVID was kind of this equalizer. Um, I never thought about that before, but I think you're right. You know, there were a lot of people that were like, it's gotta be a really skeleton crew. Like, you know, and it was like, an opportunity. I don't know how we'll do it. Yeah. 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 And it was an opportunity yeah. where like, I think you're right. Or that like, I could shine in that element because I could just like get together my like very small network of, yeah, of a famous people actor. that I trusted. I mean, you um, also, cause I want to talk about that in the next section too, because sure, somehow yeah. you get a lot of pretty known people, like the Mila Kunis's of the world, like in your stuff. Or I don't know if she, um, it, um, who, uh, or Caitlin Olsen. You have, I don't know, you have all sorts of amazing yeah. actors. Gina Davis. Uh, like The Gina Davis thing, I was lucky enough to just interview for. That actually came through... Gersh, but another director had recommended me. There was a director attached and she booked something. Allison wasn't free anymore. And I was on a short list of people. Gina, God bless her. And you won't be surprised, only wanted to work with a female director because she's an amazing champion for gender equity and media. And I was on a short list of someone that another direct that, you know, another director had recommended when she couldn't take the job. And um, but I interviewed for that Gina Davis pilot. And got it. And I, Gina is like a real role model to me. I mean, I grew up, you know, my favorite movies being Beetlejuice for a while. I literally was the, the guy with the shrunken head one Halloween. And then as I got older, then it became Thelma and Louise. But she just continued to be this icon for me. So I was a little bit intimidated at first. But, you know, I just came in strong with with ideas on like how to make it 
funnier and more elevated. And she was like, this is great. Uh, she's super lovely. But honestly, I would say I'm very ballsy about, or lately I am, about asking people to jump into things. And I think that it's a huge part of it is this. <laughs> This is going to sound quaint, but this mom group that Kara, your wife, is in as well. There, are, it started. You know, we off- had um, uh, the Chrissy, founders of the group, Chrissy Fiorelli, old pal, who is. Oh yeah, she's yeah. been on the podcast. I was texting with Chrissy last night because we need we need a spot that looks like an adoption, a lobby of an adoption agency for something I'm about to direct, and she was offering up her casting office to see if we could maybe repo That's awesome. it to look that way. Um, this is just yeah. more evidence of, I mean, a lot of people don't want to have kids cause they think it'll like put a, like end their film career, but like it just does, it does open up all these new doors. My husband thinks I'm in a cult and it's okay. I kind of am a little bit, but this mom group, it's just, there's this like unspoken rule that like, we will champion the shit out of each other and we are going to like you know, build each other up and support each other. And so, you know, if you say it's sort of this like great equalizer as well, because you might've already been like chatting about like something very, you know, like hand, foot and mouth or baby vomit or whatever it is. But then you're like, oh, hey, I'm actually directing this thing. Would you consider looking at it? And you're not some random and you're not going through a rep. You know, you both have three-year-olds or whatever it might be. And it, People have just been so open to it. Rachel Bloom is in a short that I just finished and I literally, you know, reached out to her. So you didn't know her before? You just met her through the pile? I had briefly met her through a uh, something called Ballots Over Broadway, which a pile mom, pile is the name of the mom group, a pile mom does. It was like a political event. So I met her through like a political subset of the mom group. And so there was, there was that, but no, I didn't, I didn't know her. I reached out, I explained, I sent the material. I will also say another reason that I think a lot of well-known people have been willing to jump on is because I've done a handful of advocacy work in the past couple of years, which I wasn't doing before. This is literally a result of the Trump administration, but I think ever since 2016, which is actually when I became a mom and also when Trump got elected, my fire for activism just shot right up. I think it was the first time I felt like things were really in jeopardy. And um, I started bridging my filmmaking and my experience in comedy with advocacy work. And people, when you say, oh, I'm doing a funny video, it's about gun safety, or I'm doing a funny video, it's about reproductive rights. People are just down. They're it's a down different deal. Yeah. And all of a sudden, yeah, you're working with really well known people. My thriller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Note to self. Um, yeah, no that 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 is actually a really, really good nugget. Especially if you do feel passionate about about something, like it. It's nice to have a reason to ask people yeah. to work with you. Beyond your resume mm-hmm. and your how much money you're yeah, paying. Yeah, a passion yeah, no, project. Yeah. Right. It's not just your ego. Like I just sent some ballsy emails today that I'm sure I won't hear back from to like Octavia Spencer and like crazy people that, you know, the reps oh, are Spencer at Gmail? At me. <laughs> <laughs> so you, how but, do you how do you email her? You email her agent? You look them up on yeah, IMDB Pro? That that is just me, you know, emailing reps, but I'm like, it's for abortion rights. Wait, but you're repped at Gersh, right? Yeah. A lot of our listeners, I think, think once they get a rep, that's like their mm-hmm. access to all these other people in Hollywood. But you're saying you're just going directly to Octavia Spencer's agent instead of going through your rep to their rep. To, and can you tell us a little bit about the yeah. strategy there? Well, I just don't think the budget is big enough to be involving my reps. But for Heritage well, uh, Day, uh, Hold on, but yeah. pump the brakes there. The reason... We're saying you're right, or I think you're doing it the right way, just yeah, FYI. Yeah, yeah. But, but what's but, important is that you don't need a rep to do what you're doing. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm literally going on IMDb Pro, looking at people's reps, and writing my, like, you know, pitch to why I would love to offer this person the role. And by the way, this has worked incredibly well with musicians. Like, I just, like, this short film that's starring Rachel Bloom and Vivian Lyra Blair, who plays the young Princess Leia and Obi-Wan Kenobi, I'm submitting it to festivals now. We got amazing 
music tracks like Billy Idol and the Go-Go's and people are like, oh my God, you must've spent so much money on music. I'm like, we didn't spend a single penny. And I literally just wrote these love letters to these 80s rock stars about Mm -hmm. why they were so inspirational to my childhood, why this is the song that needs to be in the film. Did you get festival rights or a festival? festival. So not online rights. Oh, no, we do have online rights. We don't have like distribution. Sure. So who cares about that? But yeah, as long as you can play in festival and put it on Vimeo, you're good to go. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it's you'd be amazed what people will do when you're just take the time to, you know, to reach out. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just like a form love letter, right? You're like, dear Billy Idol, dear Billy Eilish. Yeah. Um, and you just send totally. them the exact same letter. Well, no, I mean, for each one, I would say like for the Go-Go's, I'm like, this is a female driven story about like three generations of women. And like, it was really important to me to have this all female rock band. And this is, you know, I would connect the dots to why their song was connected to a piece of art. And who would you send it to? Like their, their reps or them? Yeah, or? their reps. I th- We spent on this case, we spent money, a little bit of money on a mom and the, and the mom group who's a music supervisor. Um, but I have reached out directly to reps as well. It's all basically online if you just spend enough time on Google. But yeah, you can, to answer your question, absolutely reach out to name talent um, without asking your reps to go through it. Occasionally, yeah. if I see someone's at Gersh specifically or right. at Echo Lake or like at one of my reps, will be like, oh, I'm really hoping they can do it. Can you send this internally? And they're like, sure, no problem. But often they're not at your agency or at your management company. And so you are just, you know, reaching out. You kind of, the truth is, is like the only thing you have to lose is your ego. At a certain age, you just stop caring. You just give less Fs and you're like, okay, it's a little embarrassing. No one responded or they're like passing goodbye, but that's it. (laughs) Nothing bad happened. The world went on, you know, it's fine. I feel like I've just stopped caring so much about getting embarrassed. That's awesome advice. Oh, that's nice. Um, And is your management company too? Yes. Yeah. Although truthfully, I think that I absolutely got both uh, reps because of my directing work. And then I kind of was like, can you rep me across the board? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and they were but like, it's different sure. agents, right? Like the it is different agents. Director. It's different departments. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But it's Gersh That's has awesome. been wonderful. They've all been wonderful. They're very, very nice people. S- specifically, I would shout out my um, agent at Gersh. I actually had a meeting with her years ago, Katie McCaffrey. And she had been, she has a reputation of being known as like this amazing agent that breaks female directors. Like she's just like a, a ball busting, like champion of female directors. And all these female directors that I looked up to were repped by her. And I had an exec at CBS set up a meeting for me. And she was like, lovely, but she was like, stay in touch. Like it's not going to happen right now, but stay in touch. And um, I did, but then I wound up signing with a management company and they were like, oh, we're thinking of setting up a few meetings like ICM, Gersh. And I was like, and they'd mentioned someone else at Gersh. And I was like, Katie McCaffrey, Gersh, go back to Katie McCaffrey. And I basically was just like, hi, it's me again. And she mm-hmm. was like, yes, great. You've been very inspiring. You have like done all the things we talked about. Like you've done so much. Let's do it. So I guess it's all to say, like, just because someone's like, not this minute, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're like, I never talked to me again. because you know, it hurt that she wasn't ready to sign with me like three years ago, but it was, she like kept her word and and I kept in touch. It was a squeaky wheel and I'm really, really happy with her. And do you feel like when you got her to sign you, do you think it was because you were now repped by a management company and like you had a big, she was part of a bigger team or do you, you think she watched, looked at your work or do you think it was more of just like off a meeting? I think because she looked at my work. I think that there was just like, I was just working one job after another, just in the hustle as much as possible. And then yeah. since you've signed with Gersh, have they gotten you any work? The Gina Davis thing was through Gersh. Um, 
I mean, it's a slow bake. I feel like when you're starting out in development, they have been getting me a lot of different meetings and generals. It's hard because everyone keeps saying like, you have to get that first episode. And because Mm -hmm. they know I have an episode coming up, there's a lot of like, let's see how that episode goes. I think you'd be really right for the show, but I think you're going to be a hard sell until you direct American auto. So let's get that. And then Let's like reconvene in a few months, which is annoying. And then maybe the second it. episode as well. Uh, every time I, I hear the second it. episode is also really hard. I mean, look, I have to join the DGA and it's expensive AF. So like I really, that second episode better be coming. <laughs> I don't want to like join the DGA and then just be like waiting Work and waiting free. and waiting. <laughs> no, because it's like. It's such it's so expensive to join that first episode's kind of like a wash. But I mean, I have a strategy in my mind. Like I really do want to get into directing cable, single camera comedy. I want to try and target some other like workplace comedies that are cable and then from there move into like more of the cable sphere. But yeah, they've been good about like setting up a bunch of meetings and they've also been pitching some scripted stuff that I've written as well. Shopping men around. Talk to us a little bit more about how you came to writing relative to your acting and directing, right? Like, was it the third yeah. thing that happened? Was, or were yes. you writing to direct? It was totally tertiary. So mm-hmm. like ultimately acting brought me into directing because I would like, even in high school, I remember doing a play when I was like 15 and this drama teacher was like, not great. <laughs> <laughs> directing us. And the whole time I was just like, I could make this better. Like I would do this and I would do that. And it would be so cool. And like, I just, you know, eventually had to like get on the other side. I, you know, the control freak in me had to step over. And then once I did, I loved it. But I, for some reason, never saw myself as a writer. And I still kind of don't, I don't know. I just put screenwriters on a pedestal. I think it's like a very, very, Mm -hmm. you know, specific craft. I felt like if I could write, I could only write with, with somebody else. I needed a yes man. I needed somebody to be there and be like constantly bouncing ideas off of. I could never do it by myself. And I thought that was the case for years. You know, I had one script that like had a lot of really great meetings, but it took us like years to write it. You know, I eventually just got over that and started writing on my own. I do still write to direct. I still, at this point, I'd be thrilled actually if somebody did option a script of mine and just, or just made something that I wrote. I don't have a lot of proprietary feelings about things. I think that's also something that like I've nurtured as I got older. You're just like, I don't have to control everything. I can like have an idea and hand it off and somebody else can direct it and do an awesome job. But I mean, ultimately, I think like as life goes on, you just get more stories and then these stories start buzzing around in your brain and they don't go away like a little firefly. And you're just like, that story is still nagging at me. I'm just going to write it down. And I think you find your voice and you're like, oh, the story is kind of like that story. And you realize you have a tone and a style. And you have something to say. I wonder how your development of as a writer has affected the way that you direct. And if you think it's important for directors to write, basically, because I think like there, I think there are plenty of people at home who are like, you know, I'm really like a visualist. And my writing is with the camera or with sound or whatever, you know, or the edit. Yeah, I think it's helped me a lot. And I, I was actually, I think like, the fact that I've edited some of my own stuff early on has also helped a lot because like when you are on set and you can think you, if you know how it's going to be edited or you know what coverage you need because you've been editing, it helps you so much as a director. And I think that it helps a hundred percent as well to write because you're constantly honing the story, honing the stakes, figuring out like what is the most interesting you know, character move here, you know, what is the most interesting arc? And you're doing that as a director as well. So if you're constantly like, you know, honing your skills as just a storyteller and thinking about character journeys and emotional stakes and jokes, even just like punch ups, you know what I mean? Like you're going to take the skill set onto set as a director and you're going to, you know, part of it of being on on set as a director is your, you know, that's kind of the second time something gets written. It's when mm-hmm. you're filming it. So if you're very comfortable with the idea that 
you can just state a story and that you have good ideas, you're going to feel much more comfortable offering, you, you know, something as simple as even just like a line punch up to like an emo- a big emotional note to an actor. You make the point everyone's trajectory is different and how, you know, it sounds like at this point, maybe you have liberated yourself from that type of thinking. You know, sure, we're all a little caught up in it still. But the idea of comparing yourself and your career to your peers, I think, is a common thing across any industry and anyone who's ambitious or motivated. But I think in entertainment more than other fields, people tend to tie their self-worth. Am I funny? Am I successful? All of that stuff. And I can say personally, my mood for sure. If I'm not working, I'm so bummed out. And some of it is about the financial anxiety of like making money, but probably more of it is about (laughs) just like, oh, am I worthy as an artist and as a person? I committed my life to something that I that's a mistake me yeah yeah if you yeah. compare that will create despair so don't do it yeah sorry i just want to interject because i meant one one mentioned this earlier but like and sorry for kind of bringing up the insecurity you know but like it but it's something that we all have and like i mean i would kill oh, yeah. to have an episode on tv and to be repped by gersh and to have all these things that you have you know and it i had lunch with tim nakashi today and he was like we were talking about how if we don't have a job for two days we're like are we directors like what are we like why are we even doing this you know in a way that like an accountant is like well i better go apply to other jobs and they're bummed and maybe worried about money but i don't know that they're like questioning their value as a person i hope like as a a that their whole career is is in question and it is hard (laughs) because we see people posting things on instagram all the time of them being awesome sure but this is a good example because I look at someone like you, Oren, and Matt, I, I would, I don't follow, follow you on Instagram. And if I That's did, okay. I would feel the same. I, I don't post um, very much. Sorry, I, uh, I retweet everything you, good that Matt tweets. And that's why I don't retweet them. Yeah. But I look at you and I'm like, God, Oren's working so much. Like he's so successful. He's like, you know, doing all these like huge budget commercials. Like I, I have envy on the flip side. So I think that like, it just goes to show it's like everybody's things. Everybody's like doing something bigger and better than themselves. Cause I feel like I'm just like in a, in a hamster wheel, like on a rat race, like trying to like constantly just like keep up. I have not elevated above comparing and despairing. That is my advice to filmmakers. And it's also my advice to myself. Mm -hmm. It's something that I have to tell myself every damn day because I do it all the time. I was trying to get an interview for a single drunk female. It's a show that I felt like Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like massively high hanging fruit. Uh, It was very female, very Jewish. Like I had a short film that's about a mother daughter relationship. That's ultimately what the show's about. I felt like I had a lot of connective tissue to offer. They wouldn't even take the interview. And then I found out someone else I know who um, is a great director and deserves it, but is, is booked on, you know, the second season. And I'm immediately just like, God, I suck. I'm never going to like, what am I doing? Like, why am I like delusional? Yeah. My advice for that is have a lot of tables around your house so you can have something to flip over. <laughs> you know, so it's constant. It's like, I have to constantly tell myself, like, you know, you just have to get sort of spiritual about it and be like, The timing is perfect. Even though it doesn't feel like it, whatever is happening right now is meant to be happening. Like stop trying to strong arm the timing of your life. You know, like this, this episode, I was supposed to direct Good Girls in 2020. It didn't happen. You know, I'm now directing my first. Yeah. It's been the two and a half year wait. It's like, that's been so, so hard. Um, So yeah, I just think that like, in you know, I, I, I have friends that have done one short film and then got repped by an amazing commercial production company and have been just like making bank ever since off of like one short. And then I have friends that look at me and they're like, I feel like you're always working. Like, what's the secret? You know, and so I think it's always relative. There's always going to be somebody to like compare yourself to. But I do think that like, if you stop trying to make sense of the business, the happier you're going to be. Because I do think that it is unlike so many careers that are more linear or where there's like a more 
you know, you get a raise da, 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 and a promotion. Like there's just like a ladder to climb and it's more obvious. There is no normal ladder in the entertainment industry or in yeah. filmmaking. This is or like directing. Frogger. You're like dodging totally. cars, but you might have to it's jump back a lane. A hundred percent. It's like some treacherous, crazy thing, you know? And it's like, some people are going to go one way and some people are going to go another. And it's like, and then you're going to fall down the chute. Like it's just, it's Thunderdome out there. And like someone else's trajectory is never going to be yours because it is the most unlinear, like nonsensical business. And so you just have to kind of like go with the flow as hard as it is. You know, even though we're talking about you in this context, I think every filmmaker, every filmmaker, yeah, every, like from the yeah. person that's never had a job to the one that's made like 10 movies and wondering what they should do next is, has the same issue of like the comparing film school is, is a, is a really great place to compare and despair. It like there's, there's not a better environment for than to like, just have a bunch of your peers all in one room, watch your work and critique it before you're good at anything or have any resources. It's brutal. It's quite terrible. <laughs> I imagine. Yeah. I didn't go to film school and I think in hindsight, like now that we're talking about it, I compared and despaired a lot less early on in my directing career because I didn't go to film school and a part of me got to just be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, <laughs> it's fine. Like, you can't judge me. I'm winging it. Like, I don't know. Like, I just, it's my first thing. It's my second thing. I'm figuring it out. But now I feel like the pressure's on and it's just like, it's not, there's just no room to like be experimental. <laughs> <laughs> to be cute it's like yeah. i feel like Called i have it, to be on, on the midlife crisis okay totally not just, not just for men anymore don't be precious i have been such a victim to it and then i've also been such a victim to other people being precious and it is like that's when i think you learn as you get older and I think honestly, not to go back to like the mom stuff, but I think that motherhood or parenthood in general breaks your soul just a little bit enough for you to stop being so precious about your work because mm -hmm. you're just kind of like your mind is a hundred places at once. You haven't slept through the night, whatever it might be. Like you're just not so hung up on like this thing you wrote right. or this idea anymore. I mentioned this first script I wrote with a writing partner and we had some really big meetings, but we, she wanted to act in it and I wanted to direct it. And we passed up really big opportunities because we didn't want to let that go. And I'm not necessarily saying give up your dreams, like mm -hmm. pass off your babies, but like, I don't know. Like, what if we had? Like you spent a lot of years waiting for that to happen, and yeah, yeah, you but write a lot guys? of movies. You have a the lot film of ideas. Didn't happen. Yeah. I, the film <laughs> never happened. I never yeah. directed it. She never starred in it. It just yeah. didn't even happen because no one was going to give us at that time, at that moment in our lives mm. where we were in our careers, that kind of money, and right. so. I mean, a part of me is like, cool, we stuck to our guns. We were authentic to ourselves, but also like we could have taken the opportunity to just having gotten it made and then gone on to the next thing, you know? Yeah. Or, or then, I mean, look, more likely it probably wouldn't have gotten made, but you would have made, I don't know, thousands of dollars. Right. Right. And also been like, hey, I just stole, sold a screenplay. I'd love to direct this next one. Like, Absolutely. I've also, as a director, I mean, I, I won't be specific about <laughs> what project it was, but it was hell. I directed this pi this independent pilot and everyone on it, all the writers, it was like their first, they were wrapped in it, you know, it, like it, it, it had legs, but it was like their first big thing that they were mm -hmm. making. And it was so hard and they just didn't trust me. Even though they hired me, they didn't mm -hmm. trust me. And like every step of the way, everything was being questioned. And even if the actors improvised something that was being questioned, because how dare they go off script or whatever it was, there was just no room to explore. It was a very suffocating set the entire time. And it was like no one was having fun. And it was just... 
I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> don't like, I need to learn like to not ever be this person, you know, whenever it is like your moment, it's just like, you got to let, you got to let people do their, their craft and know that good ideas come from everywhere. They might come from a producer or director. They might come from a PA. They might come from an actor that has one line that comes in with something hilarious. It's just like, you have to have your birth plan, but you got to be able to throw it out the door. Mm -hmm. Because if you're just like, no, <laughs> no C-section and your you're babies, you know, you've been in labor for five days. It's just like at a certain point, you have to just like understand it's a team sport. Oh, yeah, Otherwise, it's there. just really, really, really hard. That's my my two cents on not being precious. That also applies to just showing the stuff that you're worried about to the world earlier mm -hmm. than maybe yes. you think it's perfect. A hundred, a hundred percent. And I was huge on that. Like I was so intimidated as we talked about, like, I didn't want to go to like the director's meetups. Like I was afraid to even think I had anything to say or to put myself out there. Like, you know, there was always a better time. And it's just like, no, it's like, just fake it. Just shoot it. As your podcast says, it's just like, put it out there. Don't feel like, oh, this is a story I have to tell when I'm older, or this is a story I'm going to tell when I have more money. Right. Just tell it yeah. now. I mean, honestly, right now I'm dealing with something where I pitched this short that's like very comedic, but impactful and poignant. And it's about reproductive rights. And I have a company that wants to fund it and distribute it, but they want a much shorter version, like the social media bite-sized version. Right. And yeah. I'm can you, struggling with this, this 20 minute script, but can you make it six seconds? Basically, that's what I'm dealing with at this moment, like today. And I'm dealing with this struggle where I'm being precious. And I'm like, it's not funny if we make it shorter. Mm -hmm. At least it's a thing, you know, and I'm. Yeah. But and it's not being precious if you know that it's not going to be good, you know? I know. But the truth is, it's sort of like, this would be great for the midterm elections. Do I want to just get it out there or not? You know, and it's hard. It's hard. And I'm not saying like, I don't always know what the right answer is. It's just something I'm like grappling with at this current moment. Like a part of me wants to be like, take the longer version or don't. Or like, yeah. I'm not doing it. And then another part of me is like, well, <laughs> yeah, they're it's offering to find a places, short version. Fun shorts, sir. It's kind of, you know, <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, like I was saying before, I think. You know, especially when you're younger, it's harder for you to realize like, oh, if you've only got one idea, then you're not going to have a career anyway. So like, you know, just shoot it and like make it awesome and move on to the next thing is kind of where my gut's at. But also like if that be, if that changes the idea to the point where it's no longer the same thing anymore, then that's a, a different question. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I mean, could look, imagine I a world where you're like, oh, I didn't need 10 of those pages. Thank goodness right. it's it's now the runtime that it is. Totally. That could well, happen. I'm not, saying an know, artist, I'm not saying it will, but you know. I'm not saying an artist should like throw away their authenticity. I love integrity. And trust me, I fight hard for things. Like I've actually been known to be like slightly bullish sometimes when it comes to, you know, just making creative decisions. Like, you know, the client wants it one way. And I will argue if I really think like it's so much stronger this way or whatever mm -hmm. it is, even if I'm dealing with like a big commercial client, I'm like, it just is so much more effective this way. And here's why. Hear me out. I will. I, I am big on artistic integrity. I really am. But I also feel like it can't get in the way of you just like making things, period. Short and sweet. You wish you would apply to some of the diversity directing programs sooner. I think this actually goes back to the acting stuff because when you are a multi hyphenate and you're an actor, you're getting called in at like all the last minute, you know, last minute auditions. You want to be just generally available for life, always and forever. Like you're just constantly mm -hmm. around, you know, free to be booked. And I think a lot of these programs. It's actually a little bit different now in COVID life with things being like on Zoom and so remote, but like they, a lot of them do, you know, there's these commitments and you have to shadow for like a month on two different episodes. And it's like, you have to really like book yourself out of life and commit to whatever it is. And I think that I was just afraid to let my availability go. Mm-hmm for some reason, like knew of them, but didn't really like take the time to ever 
jump in and these programs become more and more competitive. I mean, like, honestly, if like a new program opens up, like if you're like, oh, some studio just opened up a new diversity program, jump on it. That first year, that second year, it's the easiest time to get in. And then they become more and more established and more elite and more competitive. And then all of a sudden it's like everybody's trying to get into these programs. I mean, there was six spaces in the female forward class of 2020. And then there wasn't even a class of 2021 because of COVID, you know? So it's just been like, yeah, I just wish that I had, they are really like a way in. They truly are a way in. If they, especially if they guarantee an episode, it's so hard to get that first episode. If you can get chosen by one of the programs that guarantees an episode, it's like, great. And like, you know, suddenly I'm just like aware of all these other programs that even just like offer funding, um, mm-hmm. like Tribeca through her lens or, you know, there's, a lot of different ones. And I think- Do you know of any programs, controversial question here, but that let's say you are not diverse. White man. <laughs> yeah. That you don't have any connections. You're a new filmmaker. You're, you're, you've been working for years in the business and you're trying to get into TV. Are there any programs that you can apply to that you don't have to be diverse? Yeah, I have to look at them, but I think a lot of them are just like emerging directors. So I need to look, but I think like Sony and like a few others are just, they're just looking mm-hmm. for like emerging directors. And then some it's more specifically like diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Um, but there are definitely a few that are just looking for like emerging directors. Independent film has a bunch of them. Sundance Lab as well. I mean, I'm still kind of coming online to like all the different opportunities. Mm-hmm. And honestly, like the reason I even woke up to it is some of the directors that I feel like are a couple years ahead of me. I reached out to them and I was like, what was your trajectory? And they Mm -hmm. did the Sundance Lab or, you know, NBC Female Forward or whatever it is. And then from there, they got their leg up and kept going. And I'm like, why am I not doing that? We've interviewed so many, like the Maggie Kylie's and, um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, Annalie Culpepper. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brenna Malloy. Yes. I think was, yeah. 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 That have like, I mean, it's, it, they, uh, Maggie Kylie did like five programs or something. I mean, some crazy amount of programs. And then finally, like she did the Ryan Murphy one and it just, I mean, now she's like one of the biggest directors on TV. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And you know, these programs are popping up more and more. They weren't even really like around 15 years ago. So it's sort of like a new, it's a new way in. It's like a new frontier. Well, awesome. Well, uh, I just want to shout out your website, Laura, L-A-R-A, Everly, E-V-E-R-L-Y.com. Do you have a few more minutes to hang out and endorse with us? Yeah. Let's endorse. Unpaid endorsements. I'm going to kick it off. So I've got two unpaid endorsements. One, they're both real, real Matt and Louis. So apologies in advance or you're welcome. Uh, The first is the classic graphic novel comic book series. Sandman has finally been adapted. Fans have been waiting for years and years and years. And it is available on Netflix and pretty good. I'm enjoying it. It's Neil Gaiman, right? It's Neil. It's what put Neil Gaiman on the map. He was a young man when he was writing it. He wrote it for years and years and years. It's pretty incredible. I miss the comics felt so of their time. They feel so like 80s and 90s in a way that I've always relished. Like they feel like a, a, like a little dated in a way that is both romantic and a little embarrassing. They've lost that. It's a, it's a pretty clean update. There's still like, you know, different eras and stuff and they're jumping through time. But uh, the modern era is not London in like 1989, which I miss. But the thing that they have kept that you know, maybe they could have uh, adjusted a little bit is that it is still very self-serious. There are jokes in the, in the show, but it's a lot of like, I am the Lord of stories and man cannot exist without dream. Take my amulet short sort of shit. So if that turns you off, you know, sounds like a dungeon master. Yeah, it's it's pretty silly. It's pretty silly. But the themes are great and uh, it's executed pretty well, really well. I'm enjoying it very much. So I would encourage you if you like the show, read the comics. If you like the comics, watch the show. And my other endorsement is A24 has their semi-regular podcast where they'll pair two different artists to talk to promote a movie, basically. So most recently they had 
uh, Daniels, as in Daniel Kwan and Dan Scheinert, interviewed by Dan Radcliffe. So it's three Daniels Harry instead Potter. of just who, Harry Potter, who was also in their first film, Swiss Army Man. So they're talking oh, right. about everything everywhere all at once. Um, but it's pretty charming. And honestly, I'm probably pretty saturated on Daniel's interview content over the last few months. However, mm-hmm. Daniel Radcliffe comes off really well. I always he's thought he was a little sweetheart. bit of a goober. Goober. He's like a, he's, he's like a sweet. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, look, cool. anyone who was Harry Potter is definitely going to be a goober. He felt like a little theater kid to me. Do you know, like a little sweaty, a little needy, a little too much. And uh, I think he's grown up into like a pretty nice guy. It seems like from this hour long conversation with some friends. So uh, I enjoyed that as well. Those are my endorsements. Laura, what do you got? I have got. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say a couple of things. I'm going to say naps. <laughs> I just want to oh, take stigma out of a nap. As somebody 100%. that does. It does get, I, I burn my energy in, in group settings. Like I, I recalibrate when I am alone. I've been embarrassed that I think I'm a napper <laughs> for like my whole life. And I think finally in my forties, I'm like just coming to be compassionate with myself that like a 20, 30 minute nap, especially when you're up at like five 30 or six in the morning with kids is okay and a great way to recharge your creativity. I feel like I come in, I'll get stuck on something and then I'll, if I am able to just like, even like nap on a lunch break or something, it's like, I'll come back and it's like, there it is. That's the idea. That was the line I was missing or that's, that's what the title is. And it's just like, it's okay to recharge your brain. You don't have to be ashamed. The other thing is I'm really, um, I think a lot of people have been watching it and it's, it's been out for a little bit, but I was just in love with physical and season two is out now on Apple TV. I think that it's such a great dark comedy and female centric show. It's like super empowering, but the cinematography is also amazing. Um, it's these beautiful anamorphic lenses and like very, you know, hazy 80s period piece, uh, really visually beautiful. And they do like these amazing camera rotations that that makes sense and are grounded in the story and like the characters inner turbulence, but the cinematography is super interesting for television. It's very cinematic and um, unique. And I mean, even down to like the wardrobe and the production design, but I've just been geeking out hard on basically everything in that show. Uh, Kathleen, what you got, buddy? So, uh, you know, I have my new segment on endorsements, things I'm annoyed by. I already mentioned this before we started recording, but like, don't hang things on doorknobs. <laughs> doorknobs are made to mm-hmm. let you open a door. And it's annoying when there's like a bag or a shirt on the bathroom door. And now you can no longer close it. This and is I, just like a live subtweet of Oren's marital relationship. He's just complaining my, about his wife. My purse is currently hanging on the doorknob over there. Why? There's only two acceptable reasons to hang something on a doorknob. One <laughs> is if, if it's a door that you really don't ever need to open, you know? Um, or mm-hmm. if you're trying to remember to take something on your way out, like, right? Like, oh, I can't forget yeah. this thing. I'm going to hang is it a good, from the doorknob. I, I am a fan of doing that. Yeah. Because you literally can't open the door without taking this thing off the doorknob. And it's, uh, it's annoying. So my endorsement is, you know, there's this new bill that just got passed by Congress. And I think it was just signed into law like today, the climate bill, climate mm-hmm. inflation, whatever bill, but. There are a few things that go into effect right away. And if you are in the market for a new car, you get a $7,500 rebate on any electric vehicle. So how long does that last for? Wait, wait, wait. What if I got an electric car last September? Did you, you purchased it or leased it? I'm leasing. I don't know about the leasing. If you purchased it, you might be able to like sell it to your husband or vice versa or something because you can get a $4,000 rebate on a used electric vehicle, which by the way, what I suggested is probably illegal. So don't do it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, $4,000 on used EVs and $7,500 on new ones. But the whole idea is to get an electric vehicle to be the same price as a gas vehicle. So if like a yeah. Ford or like, you know, they have these, these uh, plug-in Jeeps that are like high, half, half electric, um, and now with the $7,500 rebate, it will cost like the same as the all gas Jeep. So the idea is, yeah, that you can 
You can buy the same car, but an electric version for the same price. And so check it out. Okay. If people want to find out more about you, there's your website. Do you tweet or you're on Instagram? Uh, Instagram would be the main platform. It's just at Laura Everly. You can email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. Um, we love to hear from listeners. You can find us across all social media at Just Shoot a Pod. We love it if you tweet at us. I'm on Twitter at Smitey Pileg. I'm on Instagram at O Kaplan. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow across all social media. Rate us on iTunes. We'll read some reviews on iTunes. Five stars would be great. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. Go check out his Seed and Spark, everyone. Links in the description. You're listening to music provided by the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.